any questions for us or for the presenters, please that put that into the chat box section, which is in the lower right-hand side of your screen, and I will see those. Um, and as soon as we launch the presentation, you'll see your screen change. We're going to do a quick and easy poll to see what kind of people we have in the audience today. Um, Stroudwater is a leading national healthcare consultancy, um, and we have offices in Atlanta, Nashville, and Portland, Maine. Um, our first presenter today is Scott Goodspeed. He has served as the president and CEO for four hospitals. As a director with Stroudwater Associates, he helps healthcare leaders with accelerated operations improvement, revenue enhancement strategies, improved cash flow, operating cost reduction and action-oriented strategic assessment options. Our second presenter is in our Atlanta office, and that's C. Ryan Sprinkle. He's a consultant and he works with distressed hospitals and other involved stakeholders as those clients consider and implement turnaround strategies. Ryan is an experienced member of our affiliations and partnership practice group. He says that he's a licensed but recovering attorney. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Scott, who's going to get us started and um, start a poll for us. Hi, everyone. Thanks for attending. Um, we're going to talk about um, healthcare in a Trump world, but we want to better understand um, who's in the audience. So we have our first uh, poll question, and it's uh, the first of four. We'll give it just a few seconds to tabulate. All right, we're showing about 40% rural and critical access hospitals, about 20% academic, and about 15% community hospitals and physician practices. So what we're going to do today is, is we're going to try to offer a way of thinking about um, how you navigate um, healthcare policy. And so we're going to look at the uh, some of the history and, and see if we can uh, navigate this by predicting um, what we think the, uh, the outcome may be. And then we'll um, talk about some uh, bet hedging strategies at the, the end. We have a couple of poll questions about that, so we'll get a good indication of, um, of who's doing what. So here's the presentation outlined. Um, one of the things we're going to talk about is why things have seemed so different in the first 120 days of the Trump administration. And then um, we'll um, talk about how do you navigate uh, towards a likely future, and we'll describe what that operating reality may be. And then we'll come back at the end and talk about um, what are the initiatives, um, given the policy changes, given the approach, given the philosophy, and um, and again, we'll have a number of poll questions to see where um, each of you stand in some of those uh, bet hedging strategies. So we're going to talk about Trump the first 120 days. Um, but I want to put it into some context, because as we came into the, um, the January, um, it, it seemed like we were in a predictable pattern. And, and I'd submit that pattern goes back over 80 years with the beginning with the FDR administration and the New Deal and, and the quote, the four rights, um, meaning a, a job and an education for everyone, um, earning enough to buy necessities, decent housing, but also medical, uh, medical care and, and good health. And then as we came into the 60s with the Johnson administration, which was characterized as the, as the Great Society, we saw the advent of Medicare and Medicaid. And, through the Nixon administration, we saw um, the HMO Act and national health insurance and um, began to see a lot of discussion about access to care. And then with the Ford administration, <clears throat> 1974 passed legislation related to certificate of need. And, and so we're beginning to see some concerns about the supply um, side cost containment. Um, and then in 75, with the Carter administration, um, we saw a little bit of a shift from universal coverage and national health insurance to focus on cost containment, um, understanding that uh, health care was 8% of the gross uh, domestic product and, 
everyone is concerned about what we call the 10% uh, catastrophe and debt being 35% 30, of the gross domestic product. And um, so there's a big shift in terms of um, a cost containment theme. Then with the Reagan administration, uh, <clears throat> quote, the government is not the solution to our problem. It is the problem. And so we saw Medicare PPS in 1983, kind of the policy theme related to improving Medicare benefits while reducing hospital and physician payments and really an indication, let's forget, um, at least at the moment, about national health insurance. And then with the George um, Herbert Walker Bush administration, we saw the passage of stock one prohibiting physician self-referrals. Um, and a theme, again, shifted uh, to how do we reduce the, uh, the federal health care spending and a lot of that related to fraud and abuse in 93 with the um, Clinton administration, we saw Hillary Care, the advent of HIPAA, Stock 2, and um, the CHIP program, which is uh, Medicaid for Children, and the policy theme um, expanded as it related to regional delivery systems, additional cost controls, um, using market forces by requiring private insurers to compete. And then as we got into the George W. Bush administration, we saw the expansion of Medicare with Part D drug coverage and health savings accounts. So we saw the addition of some benefits because, quote, deficits don't matter. Then with the Obama administration, we saw um, significant changes with um, 2,000 pages of statute and many times that number in rules with expansion coverage and innovation and with the CMMI um, grants as well as competition um, leading to uh, cost controls. Um, <clears throat> so the last 80 years, to sum it up, um, the, the policy direction seemed pretty discernible um, with improved access, um, supportive in infrastructure, containing cost and improving quality. And then we, we came to President Trump in a different kind of approach and perspective. And, and at the beginning of his administration, we were we heard about ACA repeal. We know what the what the House did in terms of the GOP bill in terms of replace and repeal. But there was a lot of discussion going into the um, into January, February about repeal and delay, repeal and, and revise. Um, do we keep existing Medicare and um, a whole bunch of other things? And then in the in the context that President Trump was saying, I never get too attached to one deal or one approach. For starters, I keep a lot of balls in the air because most deals fall out no matter how promising they seem at first. So here is one way of, of thinking about this. And when I go through this and talk about um, kind of calculating a position and a direction and how as healthcare providers we respond to these challenges, I'm going to talk about um, trying to na navigate using three points. Um, I'll talk about philosophy, economics, and then we'll talk about the personalities, the politics, and, and proposals. And I want to be clear that I'm not making judgments, um, but just want to clarify, given some of the history and, and approaches, what we think a likely result will, will be. So if we turn to philosophy to begin to navigate um, what we think is going to happen over the next um, six to nine months. Again, as I mentioned, the last 80 years, the, the approach, the philosophy was clear, and, and, and the framework was really rooted in social responsibility related to the triple aim, and, and that, of course, relates to access, affordability, and, and quality. And then we had a little bit of a change as we came into the current administration. Um, <clears throat> And you really have to look at the libertarian philosophy and approach. And again, this is not a judgment. Um, but if you look at the excerpts from the Libertarian Party Statement of Principles, um, the first uh, principle here is uh, we, the members of the Libertarian Party, challenge the cult of the omnipotent state and defend the rights of individuals. Hold individuals have the right to exercise sole dominion over their own lives. All political parties, other than our own grant to the government, the right to regulate their lives, and so forth and so on. And as you read through that that document, um, it's pretty clear what the shift will be or what it will become. And then if you look at the Libertarian Party's 2016 platform as it relates to health care, they said, quote, we favor a free market health care system, recognize the freedom of individuals to determine the level of health insurance they want, if any 
and the level of health care they want, the care providers they want, medicines and treatments they use, and end-of-life decisions, meaning people should be free to purchase health insurance at their discretion and, in fact, across state lines. The Heritage Foundation, um, which has been around for almost 42 years, is a, is a conservative think tank. And if you look at kind of their perspective on private health insurance over the last um, 9 to 12 months, is, is their position is clear. It's repeal the employer tax exclusion, replace it with universal tax deduction or tax credits for health expenses, uh, to replace the current tax treatment of health benefits, and we saw what happened in the House um, recently, and then to devolve the regulation of health insurance back to the states, except that individuals who receive and keep coverage can't be denied, denied coverage due to pre-existing conditions. We know that may change, and that will be a state responsibility, and then individuals who wait until they're sick to enroll in co coverage, in fact, will be penalized. Again, looking at the Heritage Foundation approach as it relates to Medicare and Medicaid, for Medicare we know that in 2016 the spend was $692 billion covering uh, 58 million uh, Medicare beneficiaries, and that moves to 81 million in 2030. And the issue is that's going to generate an unfunded liability of $32 trillion to $43 trillion over the next 30 years, um, and that's not sustainable. So. So the, the, the approach um, or suggestion is that you transition the entire Medicare program to, from a defined benefit system to a defined contribution system, meaning premium support of vouchers given consumers choice, and also get rid of the 15% cap on payer administrative costs. With Medicaid, there are 70 million Americans enrolled and the combined federal state spend is a um, little over $554 billion. Um, the approach is to eliminate enhanced funding for the new expansion. So what we saw in terms of the Medicaid waivers, even though there's great concern about that in the Senate, um, um, much of that may go away. So allowing those currently enrolled in Medicaid, specifically the non-disabled, non-elderly, -el um, to opt out of Medicaid and purchase coverage of their choice using Medicaid dollars. So the general shift seems clear if we begin to think about um, the policy shift as it relates to philosophy and the big shift from social responsibility to po uh, personal and individual responsibility, not a surprise. Um, a shift from taxes to support social programs to tax cuts, uh, meaning credits and deductions. Um, government policies and, and rules to shape services to uh, dismantling the government's administrative rules. And then the government is the health care payer shifts to individual as payer arms with, arms with tax credits. The problem there is that the, the pay of last resort oftentimes in this scenario will be the, um, the health care organizations that are on this, um, this WebEx. So let's turn to, to economics. Um, we know the data um, says that this is an unsustainable path. If you look at just the level of debt in the United States. Household debt is about $14.2 trillion. Um, federal is about $20 trillion, all the way down. And the, the issue is, is debt is about 2.6 times the gross domestic product. And um, we just know by definition that's not sustainable. At the same time, um, there's a theme in here. The consumers are, are broke. And if we look at the rates of under um, insurance among adults who were insured during the year, um, and the same pattern plays out through two, 2015. If you look at those who are uninsured, um, by definition, it's out-of-pocket expenses, 10% um, of their income, or less than 200% of the uh, federal poverty level, or deductibles greater than 5% of their, their income. So 23% so of the, the total population, even though they have insurance, they're underinsured. And this is what that looks like. If you saw in the Atlantic Magazine, an article over a year ago, it was called The Secret Shame of the Middle um, Class, written by um, um, Neil Gabler here, who also um, admitted in the article that he falls into uh, this category of being uninsured. But the article summarizes that 47% of the U.S. workers can't come up with even $400 for an emergency. 71% um, are concerned about covering everyday expenses, the median net worth, is down 85.3% in 83 to 
2013. Um, we know just about a year ago this time, there was a, a free clinic in Los Angeles where 10,000 patients showed up, uh, was covered on all of the national networks, and most, a majority of those patients that showed up had health insurance. And the issue is the growing out-of-pocket liabilities um, as it relates to healthcare. 2015, it was about $360 billion. The other factor that we see playing out here is if you look at the percentage of, of covered workers enrolled in a plan with a, um, with a high deductible of, let's say, $1,000 or more, you can see all firms, that was about 50, uh, 51 percent in 2016. Um, and so it's most of the, uh, the Americans um, um, in the United States have high deductibles, and that's, again, putting pressure on consumers. So the, the shift is an obvious one, again, in terms of economics, where uh, significant levels of benefit coverage um, to high deductibles, to a mod modest focus on pre-tax um, health savings account. To, um, now the health savings account is a major source of funding uh, from reasonable level of individual liquidity, uh, liquidity to very li uh, limited individual liquidity, um, from room for more federal um, leveraging to a federal deficit about to exceed their gross uh, domestic product. So, so the economics is not adding up. So that leads us to the second poll question. All right, let me cue that up for you, Scott, and launched. So the question is, how well positioned is your organization to react to major policy or competitive changes in the environment? All right, we've got a, a lion's share voted now. We've got 9% saying they're very well positioned, 56% with well positioned, and 35% poorly positioned. With that, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Ryan. Good, good afternoon. This is uh, Ryan, Ryan Sprinkle at Stroudwater from our Atlanta office. Thank you, everyone, for your attendance. I just wanted to spend a few minutes this afternoon as part of the webinar talking about the personalities proposals and the politics of, of health care reform. How do you take the, the philosophy and the economics elements and, and blow that out down into actual policy um, that may be coming out of, out of D.C.? Uh, to understand uh, what we might expect from, from D.C. in terms of health care reform, I think it's really important that we first understand the personalities involved in um, trying to drive health care reform. And, and simply put, um, the, the Republican Party is, is a fractured party. There is no clear ideological center to the party, and that really has made it somewhat difficult for um, legislators on the Hill to arrive at uh, a, a policy aim in terms, in terms of health care reform that's tenable among its, its larger members. Uh, for, for example, uh, I, I live in the Atlanta suburbs in the Georgia 6th Congressional District, which I think most everyone watching the news today knows is, has a special election to replace Tom Price, uh, the new HHS secretary. And I know back in February when I attended a breakfast to hear from many of the individuals trying to run for that office, uh, the current GOP proposal at that time was being termed Obamacare light. Uh, in a district that uh, was formerly represented by Tom Price and a bill that was authored in large part by Tom Price. So, so the Republican Party really is fractured. Um, you have those belonging to a more establishment wing of the party that would seek to more moderately try to change existing policy versus those that would be more disruptive in the way that they um, try to implement health care reform. And importantly, uh, it's, it's important to understand how each of these different players fall into different orbits of influence around the president and who he may or may not be leaning on to help to shape that policy and any policy outcomes. Uh, so as, as we all are aware, uh, the House of Representatives voted in early May after a, a long uh, drama uh, throughout the earlier spring to pass the, the American Health Care Act through the House of Representatives. 
um, that really sets up a, a narrow path um, to allow that bill or any bills of like form or fashion to actually pass in the Senate. Because the Affordable Care Act was passed on a reconciliation basis, um, the House Republicans and Senate Republicans are looking to rely upon that reconciliation process to also pass um, the American Health Care Act. That would require a simple majority vote in the Senate, um, but because it's the reconciliation process and not part of general order, uh, the, the, the nature of, of the bill would have to touch simply to things that affect um, budgetary elements of, of policy, so the Obamacare taxes, um, uh, spending levels, and, and certain mandates. So a great question at this point is, is whether or not the American Health Care Act, as written by the House, would be able to um, sufficient pass the Senate uh, using the reconciliation process, and uh, that's that's an open question. Um, assuming that uh, the American Health Care Act or any sort of uh, repeal or replace bill passes through a reconciliation process, um, then, as, as most commentators are suggesting, uh, the administration would really rely upon uh, the Department of Health and Human Services to help uh, deregulate the marketplace through eliminating rules and other letters of guidance being issued in the wake of any new uh, new uh, bill becoming law. Uh, with the third prong of the battle plan here for Republicans at a later point, perhaps after they have a 60 vote majority, if they uh, are able to secure one in the Senate to actually tackle um, larger substantive issues associated with health care and any um, replacement bill. Uh, you know, I think a, a, a likely point of where there's little contention between the parties and um, surprisingly a level of bipartisan support that we are mostly unfamiliar with these days uh, would be MACRA. Um, I think most of the, the guidance that you see from political commentators and those who observe uh, health care healthcare policy uh, in D.C. is that um, MACRA was um, passed on a strong bipartisan basis uh, late last year. And if you look at um, CMS's actions this year under a new administration, they continue to conduct educational um, outreach efforts via webinars or other guidance activities to provide um, health care providers and health system organizations with additional learning and training materials about how they operationalize the new macro regulatory regime. So at least in our assessment, uh, at this point it seems unlikely that um, MACRA would be affected as part of any health care reform initiative. Uh, as we spoke to previously, and as all of us who, who uh, watch the, the, the national news would know, uh, the Republicans, uh, congressional Republicans attempted to uh, introduce and, and pass the American Health Care Act early in March of, of this spring. A key element, uh, just to point out in terms of a high-level issue associated with the American Health Care Act, would be the, the innovation grants um, that have been structured into the bill to be a part of high-risk pools to be set up across the country. Uh, the the, the budgetary uh, number associated with funding these pools over a 10-year period was a point of contention early as the House weighed uh, the American Health Care Act and looked at making additional modifications. Uh, finally, the bill that was produced from the House arrived at $138 billion being spent over 10 years to fund these high-risk pools in all the, the various states. This would revive the high-risk pools that were in place prior to the ACA's passage. But a reality here is that um, when you look at an estimate that the Kaiser Family Foundation has used, and this is a, a conservative estimate by their means, um, the, the high-risk pools would be underfunded to the tune of of about $250 billion over that 10-year that period, um, leaving an $122 billion shortfall. Uh, some cost estimates place the, the, the total cost from running these high-risk pools at $350 to $400 billion over the 10-year period, so uh, some fluctuation there. But uh, regardless, uh, in terms of providing that those patients and states that participate in the high-risk pools are provided with adequate health coverage, um, it, the current law or, or current uh, proposed law uh, indicates that these uh, high-risk pools would fall far short of being fully funded, and that has trickle-down uh, effects on operators of health systems and physician providers as you try to treat these patients who probably don't have the ability to pay for those services. 
In terms of a timeline that we've seen since the president, uh, the new administration assumed office early in January, uh, began with, you know, hours into the new administration, President Trump issued an executive order that granted broad leeway to the various federal agencies and departments that were responsible for crafting uh, regulations and rules to be promulgated under the ACA, really relaxed those, um, those rulemaking requirements and uh, provided guidance to those agencies that they be uh, as accommodative um, in trying to uh, increase or in trying to decrease the regulatory burden that the ACA um, in, in their estimate posed on to providers and patients. Uh, some folks see the executive order as being largely symbolic, but as we move forward um, in, the, in the next coming months, we may learn whether or not this is just a you know rhetorical exercise or if it in fact has substantive effect on the ability of, of federal agencies. In early March, the, the House attempted, or the House released uh, an initial draft of the American Health Care Act. In uh, late March, March 20th, we saw a manager's amendment introduced that provided uh, additional revisions to, to the proposed bill um, before, four days later, the House pulling the, the a floor vote on the American Health Care Act for lack of support. Uh, as news reports later provided, uh, as it was discovered in, in, in later April, Soon after the floor vote was canceled, um, select members of the House Republican Caucus began to work together to craft some sort of compromise provision to bring together the, the, the Tea Party wings and the, the more moderate Tuesday group members of the House Caucus, uh, and that ultimately led to the passage of the American Health Care Act on May 4th. In terms of comparing the American Health Care Act to the Affordable Care Act, um, a, a lot of work has been been done by various uh, individuals per, uh, reviewing these two different uh, existing law versus the proposed American Health Care Act and providing uh, some guidance as to the differences between those two. Importantly, when you look at how Medicaid would be structured in a uh, under the American Health Care Act, in 2019, uh, the Medicaid would move from being its current federal match, state match system that's been in place since Medicaid was introduced to a, a federal block grant uh, wherein each state is provided a, a funding uh, for its Medicaid beneficiaries at a per capita basis. Importantly, when you think about um, big differences between Medicaid under the ACA and the American Health Care Act, um, that expansion population, the Medicaid expansion population that received coverage under the ACA um, would would essentially vanish uh, as the federal government moves towards more limited federal contribution um, that more closely resembles the pre-ACA um, uh, um, program structure. Uh, those individuals that gained coverage through Medicaid expansion would see that coverage disappear as part of the American Health Care Act through a handful of different mechanisms. In terms of how private insurance plans um, are um, how those premiums are based and how those plans are constructed. The American Health Care Act would also uh, greatly increase the amount of latitude that states and their respective um, state commissioners of insurance have in dictating what are proper or improper health care um, insurance plans. While the uh, American Health Care Act would adopt or semi-adopt the ACA subsidy system, but call it tax credits, um, those tax credits would fade out as incomes reached 75, family incomes reached $75,000 per year. So we, um, it would move largely to be an age-based uh, tax credit with some limited mean testing, uh, whereas the ACA is predominantly means tested. The ACA also um, constricted the ability of health insurance plans to price premiums based upon the risk profile of individual members or, or, or groups of members. Um, it, it tightened the age band, I think, as many of us are aware, from a 5 to 1 ratio down to a 3 to 1 ratio. Uh, the American Health Care Act would relax and return to these pre-ACA levels. Additionally, uh, subsidies would uh, not vary with the cost of, of the, the insurance. Uh, important to um, both the American Health Care Act and many of, of, of the Republican proposals that we have seen today uh, is the preeminence of health savings accounts, HSAs, as major features of those, of those 
uh, reform packages. Under the American Health Care Act, um, the permitted annual contributions to HSAs for individuals and families would almost double um, with individuals moving to uh, $6,550 per year and the average uh, and the permitted family contribution to being right over $13,000. Uh, the ACA, as, as we all are aware, uh, infamously uh, prohibits or requires that uh, all Americans maintain coverage um, or be uh, receive a, a tax penalty for failure to have coverage. The American Health Care Act would remove the tax penalty but instead place a surcharge onto the premium that a beneficiary has to pay if they had a lapse in coverage for a given uh, period of time. And I think that period under the AC American Health Care Act is, is about six months. Uh, states would be granted uh, greater uh, latitude to relax the structure of health plans. They could scale back the number of benefits that insurers are required to cover. Um, these these uh, regulatory requirements placed uh, on health insurance plans under the ACA were arguably put into place to provide more consumer protection. So we would see those um, uh, foreseeably disappear in some states. Um, states would also have the ability to opt out of the minimal essential health benefits that all health plans are required to cover under the ACA. And as we uh, spoke to earlier, we would see greater flexibility in how, or spoke to earlier, we'd see greater flexibility in how uh, health plans could price premiums based upon the risk profile of individual members. Uh, the, the individual insurance marketplaces under the American Health Care Act. It's unclear at this point how those would operate since you would have different uh, plan structures in place and, and foreseeably uh, health plans being sold across state lines. So I think that is an, an element of the bill that uh, requires more, uh, more clarity. Uh, in terms of, of, of women's health, insurance companies would still be banned from charging uh, female plan beneficiaries more. However, states could, um, with their ability to, to relax plan structures, they could remove requirements that would place uh, the requirement that a beneficiary, all beneficiaries be provided with maternity care or contraceptive access as, as part of a plan feature. That's uh, been, been a, a wrinkle in the, the ACA that uh, has caused some questions. Uh, Medicaid would no longer have to offer these benefits. Um, which foreseeably would impact uh, the, the access to these services for low-income uh, women. And Medicaid would be barred from providing funding for any health care services that provide abortion services, including parent, uh, Planned Parenthood, which is a perennial uh, lightning, uh, lightning rod issue uh, in U.S. politics. Uh, in terms of, of taxes, um, the, AC, the American Health Care Act would repeal many of the major taxes that the ACA put in place on the medical device companies, insurance companies, and uh, higher income Americans. In total, the projected uh, amount of this tax cut would be approximately $663 billion over the next uh, 10 years. We know that there was early disagreement inside of the House caucus as to how the um, whether or not the American Health Care Act should pass. That, that led to this initial manager's amendment, which in part uh, sought to address the concerns of different members of the House caucus. So we had this, this tax sunset provision where the ACA's taxes would end uh, by the end of, of, of this next year. Uh, Medicaid expansion, uh, there was conversation as part of the manager's amendment that basically would uh, eliminate the Medicaid expansion population by the end of 2020. Um, at this point, it's uh, unclear how the Senate would address this element although some news reports indicate that uh, certain senators from more moderate-leaning states uh, are suggesting that the Medicaid expansion uh, population be covered through 2024. Central to the Medicaid reform is a work requirement that would require Medicaid uh, plan beneficiaries to uh, achieve a job status of some sort in order to be eligible for Medicaid uh, benefits. And as we spoke to earlier, a uh, shift in how Medicaid is funded from um, a matching system to a more per capita block grant system to assuage the, the fears that the uh, block granting system would 
um, greatly reduced the amount of funding provided to elderly and disabled beneficiaries, which are under Medicaid, which are a separate class of Medicaid beneficiaries. The manager's amendment introduced, introduced a, um, a different way for assessing cost inflation for those beneficiaries, and this was put in place to try and address concerns that the elderly and disabled populations um, would be uh, would, would bear brunt of the reform uh, hammer here. And uh, not surprisingly, the, the Cadillac tax or a tax on those high value health, ins health insurance plans, uh, the implementation of that, uh, which was originally proposed as part of the ACA under the manager's amendment, was delayed from 2025 to 2026, which again makes it unforeseeable that that tax may ever see the light of day. Uh, the, the members, uh, after the House leadership pulled the American Health Care Act from the floor in early or mid-March, um, Tom MacArthur, a Republican from New Jersey and a member of the Tuesday group, began to work with Mark Meadows, a Republican from North Carolina and a member of the Freedom Caucus, the Tea Party wing, um, to really arrive at a core set of compromise positions as it relates to the American Health Care Act that ultimately allowed uh, the bill to pass through the House in part, the, uh, the MacArthur Amendment would reinstate health, um, essential health benefits at the federal level, but allow states to opt out if they saw fit, and then also, also maintain um, key provisions um, in the American Health Care Act from the ACA, including a prohibition on health plans from denying coverage due to pre-existing conditions and guaranteeing coverage to all applicants um, with coverage renewal for those dependents on those plans that are up to the age of 26. So the, the provision in the ACA that allows uh, adult children to remain on the plans of their parents through age 26 was something that most, most citizens, most consumers saw as, a, as an attractive feature of the ACA and therefore has remained a key element of this and most set up Republican alternative plans, as well as um, re restoring uh, or the community uh, rating rules uh, relaxing those regulatory requirements on health plans as, as we addressed earlier, um, removing those uh, that rate differently based upon gender health status or, or age, relaxing those requirements. The conventional wisdom when you look at the House Republican bill was that the more that the, uh, the, the original bill changed to get through the House to win over the support of either moderate Republicans or Tea Party Republicans, um, that really lowered the chances of the bill surviving uh, and making it through successfully through the Senate. It, it's more interesting, though, to know that as the Senate addresses the American health care bill over the, the last few weeks and up to date, um, those discussions have gone behind closed doors, and we don't have an appreciation for, at this point, where the Senate is in examining the American Health Care Act or whether or not uh, any proposal that emerges from the Senate would be significantly different than how the House passed bill. Uh, the CBO in the past few weeks provided an update uh, report that uh, provided an estimation of how health insurance coverage would change in the country or the, the number of individuals that are uninsured would change in the country under the pro current proposed American Health Care Act. And as you can see, that report there found that uh, with existing law, so with the ACA in place, uh, there is an estimation that 10% of the U.S. population would remain uninsured through 2025. Uh, with the revised American Health Care Act, that number is expected to increase to 18.2% of the U.S. population. So for, for hospital or provider operators, you know, the implication is clear. Uh, with passage of, of the American Health Care Act or any bill that um, is of, of like form or fashion, um, there, would, uh, there will foreseeably be a, a greater number of patients that uh, seek to, to self-pay for those services or not pay at all, which could have implications for the amount of bad debt that healthcare organizations have to write off and budget for on an annual basis. The revised version of the American Health Care Act uh, in terms of raw numbers would leave 23 million more people uninsured in 26, 2026 than the current uh, ACA. Uh, Medicaid would face 
the, the brunt of the cost in terms of the federal cost savings here with $834 billion in cuts. Um, and importantly, uh, as we see this cost shift from the federal level to the states to fund uh, Medicaid, you know, how, how is that gap paid for? Is it, do we see states across the country um, putting forward more dollars to pay for the Medicaid benefits of the beneficiaries in their states? Does that fall to local governments, either through tax levies to provide more support to maybe county-owned or hospitals in, in their regions or, or districts? Um, that, that, or does that simply fall to individual patients to, to foot more of the bill? Uh, earlier this month, the Washington Post uh, did a, a number of provided a number of reports that tried to track um, where the Senate was in its consideration of the American Health Care Act. Um, I, I, I won't read through all of these in in, in exhaustion uh, through, but what we what we do know is that um, that last bullet point there, the GOP senators can lose only two bo votes and still repeal and replace the law via fast track process that sidesteps any Democratic filibusters. So the ability for the uh, Senate Republicans to pass the American Health Care Act or any other health care reform act without the needed assistance uh, in the form of Democratic senator votes is, is rather narrow. And when you look at the makeup of the Senate uh, Republican caucus, uh, there are more moderate members of, of the House uh, or the, the Senate Republican caucus in terms of proportion relative to the House. Therefore, uh, it, it makes it a harder harder track for uh, Senate Republican leadership. And just this morning, um, uh, on the drive into work, I was listening to the, to the news, and it appears that the Senate um, leadership is aiming for a floor vote on the American Health Care Act or the Senate's um, revised version of the American Health Care Act uh, later next week. Um, uh, still uncertain and it's shrouded in mystery as to what that bill looks like and, and what it contains. And uh, Democratic senators continue their efforts to try and peel off Senate Republican votes. Uh, in the last week or so, the CMS Actuary's Office provided, you know, an additional financial estimate on the impact of the American Health Care Act. Um, importantly, as spoken to earlier, they also project that uh, Medicaid, federal expenditures for Medicaid would be lowered by $328 billion um, over the course of, the, of, of that 10-year period there. Again, lower federal spending, um, which has to be made up for it at some level, either by state or local governments or individual payers. Um, they also, CMS also estimates that the American Health Care Act would increase the number of insured. Uh, this would predominantly come through a shrinking of the Medicaid population. Um, that expansion population would lose their coverage that they've received under the terms of the ACA, which again, I think, for an operator um, would foreseeably have um, a, a downwind implication for the, the number or amount of self-pay um, that you're recognizing at your facility, uh, which may impact, you know, how charitable you can be through your charitable and indigent care policies, and then what you need to do from a financial and budgetary perspective as you try and um, anticipate those changes in payer mix and have sufficient reserves in place. Most, you know, I think most importantly, I think few few Americans would would argue that um, this nation has a health care spending problem. Um, when you look at the charted growth and the percentage of um, national health expenditures as a part of gross domestic product, uh, this chart here just charts the course uh, from 2017 through 2026. If we roll back the clock and begin looking in the 60s and 70s, we would see that this um, continued in a positive linear direction. Um, importantly, though, when you look at the proposed American Health Care Act, um, there is some uh, downward revision on that trend, but the impact is, is much less than anticipated. I think the, the reality remains that regardless of, of what health care policy, health care reform may come out or not come out of the federal government and the Trump administration, um, cost containment um, and an ability to, to reduce costs continues to be a pressing issue. Um, that, that the federal government and state governments are um, seeking to find adequate solutions for. And that typically means that responsibilities for making up the gap in terms of 
of what funding is available or not available uh, will fall to local governments or individual payers. And I think an important question to ask here is what happens if legislative efforts are banned? What if the Senate is unable to pass a uh, health care reform bill or even if they do um, reach a, you know, a, a compromise bill through conference committee with the House, uh, where do we go from here in terms of, of health care reform in the country? Uh, should legislative efforts fail, uh, I think it's very likely that we would begin to see a hard pivot to health care reform through the administrative state and the various different administrative bodies, whether it be CMS, Department of Health and Human Services, or other federal agencies that have rulemaking responsibility. Importantly, uh, President Trump's inaugural day executive order really serves as the backbone upon which that um, more lenient rule, rulemaking authority um, would uh, would be based. I think in February, uh, you know, as a as a as you know, a follow-up action from that executive order in February, we saw Secretary Price and CMS Administrator Verma issue um, letters that indicated that their agencies, their departments and agencies would be more relaxed in how they approached uh, their associated rulemaking responsibilities. Um, state waiver applications for, for Medicaid under Section 1115 and the private health insurance market waiver programs under Section 1334 um, are both waiver initiatives that the ACA has permitted to states. And through the, the letters that Secretary Price and Administrator Verma issued, they made it clear that they were going to be more accommodative to states that tried to seek and pursue these waivers. I think uh, from anecdotal evidence uh, through various states that we have relationships with, it's our understanding that states that were putting together um, Section 1115 and Section 1334 waiver applications perhaps earlier in the year or at the end of the Obama administration have uh, are slow walking those applications now as they wait to see what may or may not happen on a legislative front. But should legislative efforts fail, um, it's our understanding that most of these states are going to then proceed full steam ahead with the different initiatives that they are seeking to pursue as part of these waivers. And chiefly among them, um, again, we see, uh, because they are uh, Republican-oriented states, we see a high reliance upon uh, health savings accounts as a big vehicle for um, undertaking health care reform and making patients more responsible for the cost of their health care decisions. Um, an important takeaway, less federal financial exposure for health care spending. That appears to be the chief policy direction um, under uh, the Republican uh, administration, both on, at the White House and on the Hill, which poses the question of who picks up the tab. And again, um, unless individual states are more prepared to assume responsibility for um, these new health care costs that the federal government is pushing down at them, uh, it really will fall to more local governments to be in a position to absorb um, these, these costs or otherwise look to patients to pay for those costs. So in terms of all the shifts that we see, um, personalities embracing progressive uh, policies has shifted to um, personalities in the form of politicians that are committed to policy that more closely resembles things that possess libertarian values. Um, in terms of the policy of, of each party, um, it, you know, back in the day it was easy to project what the Democratic position was and what the Republican position was relative to health care reform, especially um, during the Obama era. I think a, a key message as part of the Trump administration is that there appears to be major disagreements within the Republican Party as what is acceptable health care reform policy whether or not the Senate um, and the House are able to reach compromises on, on policy, and that makes its way to 1600 Pennsylvania, Va Pennsylvania Avenue uh, will remain to be seen. Um, in, in terms of you know, just the attitude of the American electorate, um, generally passive electorate that uh, uh, tended to uh, assume the new responsibilities that, or the new policies that were articulated and made a part of um, of, of the health care policy across the country, um, and that has increasingly moved toward a more activist electorate under the Trump administration where we see more polarity between um, members of the different parties and uh, how the American people across the country unfortunately relate to one another. Um, and, and, 
and ideally in the American system we look to the legislative process to uh, articulate our, our new policy direction in the form of, of bills that make their way into law. Uh, if we continue to have gridlock um, in, in Congress or an inability for the party internally to reach a compromise position and legislative efforts you know, fail, and I think increasingly we'll see over the next few years of the Trump administration that more action will be taken in terms of health care reform via the administrative state. And I think that brings us to our third poll question. All right, let me launch that for you right now, Ryan. All right. Um, oh, it's the what keeps you up at night question as a health care leader. Is everybody still awake out there and would like to participate in what your biggest Let's see, we've got responding to legislative uncertainty, executing on key strategic opportunities. Okay, we've got a lot of folks saying keeping my organization financially viable. More than 60% right now. Okay, with 60% of the vote in, wow, 71% saying keeping my organization financially viable, followed way behind with effectively competing under value-based arrangements. Back to you, Scott. I'm going to take this one. So let's spend the last couple of minutes talking about uh, strategies and what we can do to prepare. And I'm going to go over this at a pretty high level because we've got about eight minutes left. Um, I'd like to answer a couple of, of questions. So um, with growing personal um, financial exposure, um, we're seeing our clients across the United States uh, uh, talking about how you can be more price uh, competitive as it relates to uh, consumer shopping. So. Many of our clients are looking at their charge masters and beginning to price competitively for select services. And um, probably as important, if not more important, is is we're getting the message back that customer or patient experience counts. Um, we're also hearing that that can, in fact, move market share. The second strategy is pay mix will move at the uh, at the margin. So, in fact, if we see additional uh, Medicaid. Uh, share expansion through the 11 and 15 uh, waiver, um, you know, they're, they're with an employment um, requirement, um, you know, that could uh, that could change payer mix. Um, in addition, uh, more medical indigent population as uh, exchange subsidies disappear. That's not a surprise, and um, continued reductions in uh, in Medicare. So we're hearing. Um, um, Pretty evasively, that uh, that uh, strategies are being developed by um, payer category, um, just to address the different market realities. Third, um, of course, uh, um, really get good at point of collection, um, point of service collections, because of the um, you know the consumer movement we're seeing here. And in addition, the uh, the health savings account, the growing balances there. Number four is get lean, not a not a surprise, um, but in applying what we call accelerated operations and improvement tools um, with clients, um, we still find between uh, 2 to 3 percent minimum potential for increasing operating margin. Um, so those of you who have a, a strong balance sheet um, and are doing relatively well, now is the time to begin to look at uh, operations improvement and um, where you can um, get a little bit, if not a lot more lean. Um, um, all of our clients are looking at uh, kind of their employee physicians and providers, and we know that the average loss per employee provider nationally is about $190,000. Um, in our experience, there's no magic bullet, but uh, to at least get out in front of macro, because we know it's not going away, could make a pretty significant difference in your revenue longer term. Um, number six is consider strategies ranging from direct contracting, and we work with a very large um, physician provider group in the state of Florida that is uh, going direct contracting with uh, with Disney and some of the other um, employers. So um, the other thing is if you can um, 
um, begin to manage your upside risk and manage full risk um, with an employee population, um, assuming you've got a full, a self-funded um, um, plan, um, that's a good way to begin to learn how to manage um, um, risk. And then finally, number seven is is um, begin to review your capital structure and and consider whether your your real estate portfolio makes uh, sense. And again, if you have a strong balance sheet, um, you have the ability to um, think uh, strategically and. Um, but that flexibility can erode a balance sheet very, uh, very quickly. If you've got a weak balance sheet, um, and we're working with a, a number of clients now that um, uh, could, can sustain a kind of the storm, if you will, for maybe 12 to 18 months. But if you look at what's going to happen to their balance sheet and erosion, there they're beginning to look at um, a number of what I call strategic options in terms of um, everything from uh, affiliation to a uh, to a, to an asset merger. So we have one. We have one more poll. Oh, number eight. Now we'll have a poll question. Number eight is um, um, to develop some financial uh, what if projections and and use a sensitivity analysis to look at the impact of various scenarios. And those are the scenarios that uh, that we um, talked about. And um, just to begin to understand the impact of uh, kind of not only the legislative initiative but some of the market. Uh, initiatives that we just talked about. So with that, because of time, um, let's uh, let's go to poll question number uh, number four. All right, here we go. My organization has work to do in the following areas. Um, responding to healthcare consumerism, getting lean with operations, optimizing physician practices, engaging in direct contracting, and managing our capital structure. Give people 30 seconds to wake up their fingers. Pretty equal breakdown so far. All right, we're coming in with 47% uh, stating that it's responding to healthcare consumerism, 53%, the largest um, selection, getting lean with operations, 44% optimizing physician practices, 34 engaging in direct contracting, and 39 managing capital structure. So with that, um, Kimberly, you may want to talk about uh, the, how we're going to distribute the, uh, the PowerPoint, and then if we've got uh, we've got maybe a couple minutes for questions. Sure. Um, I will, um, within the next day, be sending you a link to the presentation materials as well as the recording. So look for that. Um, and let's see what questions did we have come up here in our last minute or so. All right. Um, do you think the American Health Care Act, as opposed to the ACA, will address incentives towards population health um, because those measures help reduce costly health care? Uh, Ryan, you can help me out with this, but I, um, I think the, uh, when you consider macro, and I think that's probably the one stable thing that we're, we're seeing here, I think that um, um, provides some incentive and, and addresses the issue of, uh, of population health. Um, um, unfortunately, I think the general shift from um, what's going on today to individual re responsibility, um, we may be seeing a little bit of a shift away from uh, disease management um, in terms of how we get paid for that. Um, that doesn't make it any less important, but I think we're going to see that shift. Ryan, do you, you know, have I, comments on yeah, that? I, know, I would absolutely agree, Scott. Um, it, it really does appear that the, the policy shift, if you know, if it's actually results in an actual law um, would be one that moves away from population health and more towards, you know, individual responsibility and therefore it is more of a, an, an interaction between the, the patient slash healthcare consumer and their provider or provider organization. So I think, um, you know, if we see, if we see the American Healthcare Act or any of its, um, uh, any other laws similar in, in tone and policy structure, uh, we can expect that 
the need to be able to execute on consumer-oriented uh, healthcare delivery um, will only heighten as, as more of that responsibility will shift down to the individual. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Scott. Um, we're at top of the hour. I want to respect everyone's time. Thank you so much for joining us today on the call. Um, on behalf of my colleagues in Portland, Maine, and Atlanta, and Nashville, thank you so much for joining us, and we hope you have a great day. Thank you.